Diversity has defined Florida ever since the first Paleo-Indians arrived over 12,000 years ago and began adapting to our state's remarkably complex ecosystem. And Gary was talking about the Calusa from the technologically sophisticated Calusa with their canals and artificial islands to the Tamuka and Appalachia with their intricate agricultural societies. The state's pre-contact people appear to have developed a series of competing cultures, largely governed by the regions they live in. Of course, our understanding of those people, as we've heard in the discussions and debates, even the discussion of how accurate a portrait of their agricultural patterns were, is very limited because it relies on the survival of a relatively small number of artifacts and accounts by Europeans who are more interested in expanding their own cultures than in documenting those already here. While Spain dominated the colonial period, France and England left significant legacies as well. The greatest body of our early literature, is, of course, records Spain's extended quest to establish a permanent settlement in La Florida. Many of the talks that we've heard over the last couple of days have focused on how difficult that process was. We have accounts from Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca's remarkable narrative of self-discovery in his Relacion, the two accounts of Hernando de Soto's heroic expedition by the gentleman of Elvis in Garcilaso de la Vega, poems by Bartolome de Flores, Juan de Castellanos, Alonso Gregorio de Escobedo. Of course, there are a lot of other documents. I'm going to focus on works that I think have literary value. And all these works, I think, have significant literary value. But even among these works, our diversity is evident. The gentleman of Elvis, after all, was a Portuguese officer who went on De Soto's expedition. And he wrote his account in his native language, while Garcilaso de la Vega named himself El Inca to reflect the fact that he was born in Peru, the son of a Spanish captain and an Incan princess. Our first poem, the first poem written by someone known to have spent time in Florida and in the United States, this is the first American poem, came as a direct result of Spain's settlement of this city. Oddly enough, that poem is in French. It's an octet of frustration by Nicolas Le Chalot, a carpenter and lay preacher who'd been part of the French Huguenot attempt to establish Fort Caroline. After Menendez's victory, Le Chalot was one of the few French to escape and return home to Dieppe, where he decided in his brief poem to warn anyone thinking of Florida and I'm about to demonstrate what a poor linguist I am in both French and Spanish. Qui veut aller à Floride? That the experience had left him worn out by rot. Abatu de purete. By the way, somebody's supposed to put your hand up and, by the way, please don't take more than one of those. Only one winner per person. Go, grab one. This is, that's one way to get the stretch during yeah. things like this. The most notable of the Huguenots to die in that conflict between Spanish and French was Jean Ribot, who had led the first attempt at French settlement, Charles Ford on Paris Island. We've been hearing a lot about Paris Island, both the French and the Spanish interest in it. And he only assumed command of Fort Caroline with the second group of settlers. He missed the initial group because he was in the Tower of London. He had gone to England to convince Queen Elizabeth to help support French, Euro, I'm sorry, European Protestant settlements in North America. Um, the British believed he was a spy. They put him in the Tower of London. And while he was in England, he wrote an account of his trip to Florida. And I believe he is the person who also translated, the translation appeared 
almost at the same time as the French appeared. We do not have copies of the original French. We do have copies of the English translation, which was published as The Whole and True Discovery of Terra Florida, 1563, which offers the colonial era's most beautiful account of the New World. It's a hypnotically lyrical description of this incomparable land, which he describes as the fairest, fruitfulest, and pleasantest of all the world, filled with a people of goodly stature, mighty, fair, and as well shapen and proportioned of body as any people in all the world, very gentle, courteous, and of a good nature. Incidentally, for those of you looking for topics for novels, Rabot's period in England is really promising. He had a curious relationship with Elizabeth, which I think is underlined by the fact that when he was released from the power and planned to return to France and join the Huguenots' second expedition, Elizabeth offered him a pension if he would stay with her in London. I'm not sure how you want to deconstruct that, but um, the more we learn about Elizabeth and all the Tudors, the more interesting that might be. While France relinquished its geographic and political claim to Florida after the loss for Carolina in 1565, it continued shaping our culture both directly and indirectly. In 1801, François René, who would later become the Vicomte de Chateaubriand, um, and he is he was, and this speaks to Gary's talk on food, he was a renowned gourmet and gourmand, and he liked his beef so much that his sh personal chef decided he needed an extra large cut of beef, which was the source of Chateaubriand. Chateaubriand published Atala, which is a short novel about the natives of Florida, and earned him immediate fame. And eventually, he was recognized as France's leading writer in, and intellectual, the father of French romantic prose. Atala is also the first Florida novel. So our first poem and our first novel are both in French. Seems very curious to me. The novel is a story of noble savages doomed in the midst of a natural paradise that was slowly being transformed by pragmatic Western values. And it helped shape much of American literature and mythology throughout the 19th century. Since Chateaubriand, France's influence on our literature has been largely indirect, primarily through works in Creole and English by Florida's Haitian community people like Edwidge Danticat and Felix Morso Leroy. By the way, Atala is a very short book, but it's also a French novel, which means that it has no shortage of description. The French tend to love their adjectives, and you need to read it with a good deal of patience, especially if you like plot for it. When Atala appeared in the first year of the 19th century, the two Floridas, remember British, had divided into East and West Florida, and the Spanish had kept that division, were the most ethnically and culturally diverse area of North America, with a population, of course, the border is far larger than they are now, that included a variety of Native American communities, the descendants of Spanish and British colonists, British loyalists who had come down from the colonies, Americans, Canary Islanders, Menorcans, Greeks from New Smyrna, Scotch-Irish, French Huguenots, Acadians, Jewish traders, and Africans, both free and slave. We've always been an extraordinarily diverse community. Despite that rich variety of peoples and tongues, the two languages that have primarily shaped our state's history and culture are Spanish and Anglo-American English. As you probably know, we're constantly subdividing English. The conventional account of our literary history has been essentially bimodal in a simple sequence. 
with a Spanish colonial tradition, we replaced first by a pragmatic British colonial one with writers primarily interested in anglicizing or de-Hispanicizing the state, followed by waves of American and other immigrants embracing English as their primary language of literary and social discourse. Once Florida became an American territory and then a state, our traditional literary history holds, the Southern farmers, Yankee entrepreneurs, Midwestern snowbirds, and tourists who flocked to the Sunshine State created a linguistic and literary culture which eventually absorbed even the children of non-English speaking immigrants. While English has clearly been the dominant language of our literature for much of the past two centuries, that fact often conceals the ways Spanish culture has continued to influence Florida's evolution. What has actually existed, and this is really my point, almost from the time of the Europeans' first contact is a literary and cultural DNA formed by a double helix with Spanish and English strands constantly wrapping around one another. Over time, those strands have not only become more tightly interlaced, but each strand's membrane has become increasingly permeable. Once the English began their attempt to redefine Florida by dividing it into separate regions, anglicizing its landmarks, and cataloging its flora and fauna, the Spanish strand of our literary DNA developed through four distinct nucleotides as the two cultures became more tightly intertwined. Okay, that is as far as I'm going to push the biological metaphor. It's, um, I'm constantly chiding my students for their lack of knowledge of science, so every once in a while I have to throw something out. Of course, it requires an awful lot of Googling to throw that out. The first and oldest of these traditions is la tradición itself. Primarily the work of, Span of writers in Spanish who see themselves in temporary or permanent exile. The second consists of writers in English relying on a wide variety of stereotypes to demonize or romanticize our Spanish heritage. The poet and historian Carolina Ospital calls writers in the third tradition los atrevidos, the daring ones, people of Spanish heritage who choose to write in English. Like, los, like those daring ones, the final tradition which seeks to reimagine our continuing Spanish heritage is a revisionist one. Native English writers reconsidering both that past and its implications for our present and future. The most obvious tradition was the continuing Spanish one. Initially, that involved the extensive communication and connection between Cuba and Florida. By 1891, Cubans in Key West numbered 8,000, a majority of the population. And, the, and Gary has talked about the great number of Cubans who came to Florida to work in various industries. That presence also translated into political influence. In the 19th century, both Cuba and Tampa had Cuban-American mayors. 